Okay, I think uh, I'll go ahead. This is Jeannie Fander. I'm at the University of Arizona and the uh, oh the project leader or group leader for the online education uh, uh, group in, in sustainable RT, sustain RT. So really all I want to do is welcome everybody and uh, move on quickly. We have a very short time and we want to give Miguel, our speaker, uh, as much of that time as possible. So I'm going to let uh, Madeline uh, take it from here with a quick introduction. Great. Thank you, Jeannie, and welcome to everyone and Miguel. Miguel Figueroa leads ALA Center for the Future of Libraries. The center identifies emerging trends relevant to libraries and the communities they serve promotes futuring and innovation techniques to help librarians and library professionals shape their future, and also builds connections with experts and innovative thinkers to help libraries address emerging issues. Miguel previously held positions with the American Theological Library Association and ALA's Office for Diversity and Office for Literacy and Outreach Services. He's a graduate of the University of Arizona's Knowledge River Program, which is an initiative within the School of Information that examines library issues from Hispanic and Native American perspectives. Thanks so much for joining us today, Miguel. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so thanks to Madeline, Beth, Jeannie, Tracy, Arlene uh, for helping to bring this together. And uh, thanks to all of the attendees for joining us. Um, I just wanted to clarify, I think we're going to use the chat as the question feature, and I know one of our facilitators will kind of chime in if questions are relevant to some of the content that I cover um, as I'm covering it. So feel free to, to chime in with questions as needed. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go a little fast, I think, but hopefully this will work. Uh, I wanted to start today's presentation with the kind of uh, academic approach to thinking about the future. And this is the framework foresight. It's kind of a modified version of the cone of plausibility. Um, and it was developed by Peter Bishop and Andy Hines and their colleagues at uh, the University of Houston's uh, foresight graduate program. And the model is really meant to help us think about the future in a very logical way. Um, it assumes that if we're in the present, that kind of circle right in the middle, um, that tomorrow and the next week and the next month will likely be pretty similar to today. But as we continue out from the present looking to the right and looking to that broadening cone, we see that there's going to be a wider and wider range of possible futures that we could move okay. into. And that range of possible futures expands, and it's really hard for anyone to pinpoint exactly where uh, we will be in the future. It's really hard to just say we'll be right here because there's just so much happening in the future. Um, but there is this sort of baseline that comes out of the present and it's a development into the future that extends from the present into probable futures. It's the idea that what's happening today will continue to matter into the future. That baseline is developed by our assessment and scanning of the environment, and it's a really intentional scanning that looks across several domains of change. For my work, I've organized those domains of change to be society, technology, education, the environment, politics and government, and then economics and demographics. Sorry, let's just go back there. Um, and the important thing is that we have to keep looking across those categories of change to understand the full scope of what might happen in the future. And then we also have to keep watching that baseline. We have to remain observant of the trends happening in our world so that we can continue to make sense of the future. So the important thing that we can do right now is to understand changes happening across many domains of change. And when we do this, we better understand that baseline of change that comes out of the present and understanding those domains of change help us better understand the broad range of plausible futures that may arise. It helps us make sure that we can more accurately point ourselves towards alternate futures or lead to a preferred future that we'd like to see. So with that in mind, um, this is kind of the summary that was part of the introduction. What ALA is really trying to do is identify emerging trends that are relevant to libraries and the communities that they serve, 
promote this sort of futures thinking of looking outside so that we can help librarians and library professionals shape their future and then build connections with experts and innovative thinkers who can help us better understand the trends and things that are happening in our current world. Um, I often summarize uh, our work by pulling and adapting this quote from Skift. And Skift is a market research firm in the travel and tourism sector. So what I did is everywhere that Skift used the word travel, I substituted libraries. And they say that being fanatically focused on the changing consumer behaviors across all sectors, not just libraries, whether because of digital tools or globalization or other generational factors, rather than what silos are doing talking among themselves and how that affects libraries in their future. The future of libraries will be defined by leaders who understand the larger context in which libraries operate, not by navel gazing. We keep having a slide that jumps around. So, um, so I think that that's the really important thing. We have to look outside. We can't just expect to solve our problems by looking within libraries. We really have to look out and adapt and maintain relevance with, with what's happening outside of libraries. So the trend work that I'm doing uh, resides at our site, ala.org slash library of the future, and it's a growing list of trends. We now have over 20 trends in total. And I try and develop the trends from those categories that we talked about earlier, society, technology, education, the environment, politics and government, uh, and demographics. Um, and for each trend, you can go to our site, and if you click on one of the circles, for each trend entry, I try to explain the trend in brief, so just a quick summary of the trend, and then look at how it's developing in our world right now, and then also try and uh, extrapolate why it might matter for libraries. And I try and bring in all the articles and reports that helped inform my understanding of the trend so that if there's a trend that you really like, you can look at some of the research sources and try and learn more about that trend from, from that spot. My hope is that libraries and librarians can use this for their own professional development when you need to know something about what's happening in technology or the economy. Uh, that we might be able to use it for long-range planning when we're making some of that environmental scanning that we all do, making it a little bit easier. And I think that it's also become really important for talking with community partners. It helps us use the language and trends that they might be most interested in and lets them show how those connect to what the library is thinking of. So it, it has multiple opportunities, I think. Um, Given the focus of this webinar, I wanted to spend the remaining time highlighting a few of the trends that I think uh, have the greatest implications for sustainable communities, even if they don't specifically come out of that environmental uh, uh, focus of our trend scanning. So the first one is going to be collective impact. And collective impact seems like a really good place to start. It's a model of change that was first introduced in a 2011 article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. And that article was by John Kenya and Mark Kramer. And it's become this sort of model that uh, the Social Innovation Review keeps revisiting. And you start to see different uh, groups using this as a model to address big issues. What collective impact says is that there are these complex social issues like hunger, poverty, violence, education, and yes, the environment that really involve lots of different factors and responses and many different community organizations. In order to bring organizations together, collective impact, initi impact initiatives need an influential champion. They require adequate, adequate financial and personnel resources, and they uh, need a sense of urgency for change within the community. And those things can only happen when we have groups coming and working together. I think as we look at sustainability, the collective impact model is a reminder that the library will be part of a solution, but that we really have to uh, have real working relationship with other players in the community that are working towards sustainability. If we don't understand our relationship to partners, and if they don't understand the role that libraries play, then this big challenge of sustainability is going to be that much more difficult to tackle. Um, I think sustain, uh, collective impact is a really important term to use with potential partners. It may also be a term that's used in larger community gatherings or city hearings, those types of things. So building our awareness of this model is a really important uh, step for us. Um, 
Fast casual is usually the one that makes people think that I'm weird, but it might leave the most lasting impression. Um, most of us know fast casual, even if we don't know the term. It's a restaurant concept that's positioned between fast food outlets like McDonald's and more casual service restaurants like Chili's, where you'll have a waiter um, uh, and order from a menu that's given to you. Uh, most of us probably know fast casual as Chipotle or Panera or even Starbucks, which has really helped pull in some of the fast casual elements into their sort of coffee house model. Um, Fast Casual's hallmarks include counter service, customized menus, freshly prepared and higher quality foods, and upscale and inviting dining spaces. Fast Casual does a really good job of integrating technology, whether it's Wi-Fi in their spaces, electrical outlets that are readily accessible, mobile ordering and payment options. And they also provide really flexible seating options so that people have the opportunity to, to of course, come in and eat, but you'll also see that they transition from that dining experience to working in the space or socializing in the space or doing lots of different things in the space. Um, I think for most of us setting up our spaces in libraries, we can start to see we're borrowing a lot from that fast casual idea. But let me also suggest that fast casual is driving an affordable, upscale, aspirational experience for consumers. Um, they're really trying to say that you can affordably have a really nice dining experience uh, and you can do something that treats yourself um, without kind of breaking the bank. Um, as part of this, I think the really interesting thing that they're doing is they're infusing an eco-friendly ethos into the dining experience. Our fast casual restaurants are popular, popularizing all natural, local, and organic foods. They're emphasizing recyclable or compost, compostable packaging. And they're taking stands when they can't deliver. I think some of us might remember that Chipotle recently removed a popular menu item because their animal welfare auditors found that a major supplier was violating their core standards. And rather than accommodate that, Chipotle said, we're not going to feature it on, their menu, on our menu. So they're really taking a stand and saying, these are our values, this is what we believe in, and we won't bend from that. It may seem really tangential, but these are popular outposts that are helping to change consumer behavior and interests. They're putting these ideas and ethics front and center for a wide range of customers. And so if those customers start to, start to experience these behaviors and practices in their fast food dining, I think we can start to think about those in their city experience or their campus experience. They might start looking at us and saying, why isn't the library or this information organizi organization emphasizing sustainable practices, recycling? Why aren't they trying to minimize waste and observe our environment? So I think fast casual is a big influencer um, in ways that we might not be thinking. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on resilience because I think most of you are probably more expert than me. But this idea of a culture of resilience um, bolsters support for preparedness and response and enables better, participant, a better anticipation of a response to disasters and their consequences. So it's really the idea that in a period of climate change and other things, that um, resilient communities will be better prepared to bounce back from, from changes in their environment. They'll be better able to take care of the people within their community. Um, I think the really interesting thing that's happening in resilience is that it was originally focused on individuals, communities, and then institutions, businesses, and systems. And I think a couple of initiatives are moving resilience towards a more top-down approach. They're inspiring this thinking that it's a city's responsibility or a planner's responsibility. But I think many people still view resilience as starting with individuals and communities leading a shift in culture. Individuals and communities are going to prepare themselves and plan in a way that they can be responsive. To do that, resilient communities need to foster social equity and inclusion, they will need good information to plan with before disaster or change strikes. And they'll need reliable access to technology and resources in the face of disaster and change. These are things that libraries and librarians can provide and promote. And I think it's a really important thing to remember that not only do we make our building resistant or our services resistant, we really want to help individuals and people 
become resilient to what the changes that they may experience in their communities. Um, the sharing economy, uh, I'll just say that that's why we had libraries. So last year I went to this talk about the sharing economy and this really smart woman described her initiative and then she kind of offhandedly remarked, you know, it, it's why we had libraries. Past tense, absolute, I don't think anyone in the audience kind of flinched, really. Um, it was really interesting to hear them say that. But as I listened more closely to the panelists at that, at that session, they really started to see what they're doing as very different from what libraries or traditional sharing places might be doing. They see that they're leveraging social technologies to help users share resources, goods, services, and skills. But they really see the key to their equation, the outcome of the equation as they're sharing and they're using technology, but they're creating a new experience. You get to experience a meal at someone else's house, or you may connect by sharing a room or a house rental, or you might even share a tool from a more experienced craft person and become closer to your neighbors or closer to an expert. That's the type of thing that they're seeing. So it's not just about sharing the thing, it's about creating an experience that is shared. Um, that's going to be sometimes tough for libraries, I think, because some of our values try to respect the privacy of the user, and experience is hard to create if we're focused on the privacy of the user. Um, that's one thing to tackle. But I think for this conversation, as we look at sustainable communities, one of the most important things the, that's happening in the sharing economy is that it's become a much larger umbrella, umbrella for several models of sharing. We have sharing and collaborative consumption, but we also have the gig economy that's kind of coming out of this sharing culture. Um, so there are some services that share, that are real ally to creating more sustainable communities. They're saying that we don't have to be a consumptive uh, society, that we can buy limited numbers of things, but more effectively share them across the community. There's a lot of services, though, that might be broadly grouped under the sharing economy, but that are doing some difficult things that we're going to have to reconcile. So some services may be driving down wages for specific sectors and contributing to income inequality. Um, some of these sharing platforms are really more business-driven than community-driven, and we're going to have to think about, well, how does that affect the idea of sharing? Um, so the sharing economy is one of those trends that if we monitor closely, we can see that it's starting to diverge into a couple of different things instead of just that one common trend. And we really have to explore how each fraction of that sharing economy is affecting the library's place and community's relationship to the library. Um, let's see, last slide. Okay, um, urbanization. So. Urbanization, I think most of us are aware of, globally more people live in urban areas than in rural areas. And it's a trend that has continued to increase since 1950. And the assumption is that up to 2050, 66% uh, of the world's population is projected to live in urban areas. Urbanization is going to lead to more concentrated economic and government activity and new transportation demands. I think those are the interesting ones. That, those are the obvious ones that we know but I think it's also going to focus a lot of attention on environmental needs. There's the threat of increased consumption and pollution as we move to more urbanized environments. There will be increased demands for water, energy, and waste disposal. And the concept of getting those services to more urbanized communities may also further tax the environment. Um, cities are either going to want to, uh, there's gonna be, uh, cities I think are either going to want to or need to invest in more sustainable planning. They're going to have to find environmental friend, environmentally friendly buildings, cleaner transportation options. They're going to have to invest in recycling initiatives, explore food security issues, and also uh, look at energy efficiency measures. I think they're all, as we move into urbanized environments, I think we're also going to start to see more mixed-use facilities where the library may be part of a mixed-use environment where there's a uh, business, uh, the library, and then also like housing all uh, within a relatively compact, space, compact and more efficient space. I think this is something for us to think about as the library fits into the urban environment and certainly also as we support 
researchers, advocates, and other people within the community who are trying to tackle these big urban environments that we help ensure that they have adequate information because urbanization is not just something that's happening in Africa or Asia. It's really something that's happening globally, and we're starting to see large urban cities. You know, there's, there was a conference on the mega urban metropolis of Chicago that extended from Milwaukee all, all the way into parts of Indiana. Um, so they're starting to see that these are sort of urbanized environments that are collecting around one city. So it's not just something that's happening on other content, continents. It's very much happening within our own environment as well. Um, I'm probably over my time or else I went through that really, really quick. So either way, I apologize. But uh, I want to thank you for sticking with this. Uh, I want to encourage you to check out the center's site and some of the information that we're promoting I will tell you now, I rely heavily on member feedback to improve our coverage of trends and to come up with ideas for new trends. I think that I'm a pretty nice person, so um, please feel free, email me, um, feel free to give me a call or something. Uh, I love it when people call and say, have you thought of X or Y to improve your coverage of a trend, or have you thought of X as a new and emerging trend to cover? Um, I'm kind of like a piano player. I take requests, and I really appreciate uh, what you do. Um, so I think we still have about eight minutes for questions. Uh, and I'm trusting Madeline or Jeannie might help me with that. Actually, Miguel, I will. This is Tracy. Oh, great. And um, so we have some a few points and questions that came up during your chat. Great. If any of our participants want to uh, send any more out, please do. You know, we had a couple of points about when you were talking about urbanization, about the corresponding trend towards urban agriculture, gardens, and wildlife, uh, yeah. things along that line. Are we seeing that worldwide, or is that more in, um, you know, is there are there locations where that's more or less happening? You um, know? I think the urban agriculture and those types of urban uh, farming type initiatives, I think the move towards social innovation where – uh, we're trying to find ways to innovate for social benefits is having an effect uh, stateside, but we're also seeing a lot of people uh, deploy their social innovation initiatives uh, internationally to help communities that might be most vulnerable. Uh, so I've seen a lot of things around like the storage bin uh, or the trans the big uh, uh, oh I've lost the word shipping containers the shipping containers. Mm -hmm. uh, those are happening in Boston, but they're also happening, you know, in, in Africa and, and Asian mm -hmm. environments as well. So it's, it's kind of cool to see us innovate for our own communities and to help other communities as well. Yeah. Great. Would you maybe talk a little bit more about, you talked in your introduction and Madeline did too, about the ALA Center for the Future of Libraries, but maybe you could tell us a little bit more about, about the center itself and, um, expand on that? Um, well, I, we're only about a year into this. So it, it's been a learning process. And we're very much modeled on the work that the American Alliance of Museums did. They have a Center for the Future of Museums that they've been operating since about 2008. Um, and we're starting small, I think, and really trying to push some information out to members. Uh, there's going to it right now it's just me to be honest I mean as a center it's it's just one person uh, but it's been a really good point of dialogue with members I think uh, we're excited to have uh, uh, some member leaders come in and join the conversation through a working group that's being put together by the ALA executive board and president um, and hopefully that'll increase the dialogue and I think it's been a really interesting opportunity to talk with outside experts um, I've been really interested. It's given me an entree to just say, hey, ALA is uh, thinking about the future of libraries uh, in new and different ways. Would you like to talk to us a little bit about how you see the future or other things? And it's been a way to talk to different nonprofits like the Long Now Foundation and different companies like Steelcase. We had a chance to talk with some Google people that we hadn't talked with before. Uh, so that's been a really interesting process as well and to really bring their thinking uh, not just about libraries, but they're thinking about the future into our conversations. Great. We've gotten a couple of um, messages in our chat box since we've been talking and uh, some more questions about the urban issue. And 
Um, won't this dense living help conserve resources since the service geography is not so far flung? And then also a question about um, any suggestions for community involvement from community members who are interested in helping libraries move forward towards sustainability. Um, if you have any any thoughts on that. You know, I don't like I'm not an expert in sustainability the way that uh, most of your members are probably more invested in it. The thing that I've learned, though, from this process is it's really interesting to ask community members just to talk to you about how they see their future or the specific issue that they're working on at the present time. A lot of people that I call they immediately start to say, well, I don't know libraries that well, or I don't, and I, and I quickly tell them, I'm like, don't worry, just talk to me about what you're focused on right now, what you're passionate about right now. And I'll, I'll and the ALA will kind of do the work of translating that into the library environment. But we really have to get out of the silo idea that everybody has to apply their ideas to the library and instead try and think of, how does the library meet the ideas of the community where they are? Great. Can you um, maybe touch on some of the trends you see that on the importance of libraries as a social sharing place? You talked about, you know, the sharing economies and the experience and touched on that a little. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about libraries as social sharing? Um, I think as social, sh so by social sharing, we mean um, community, essentially. I mean, building community connections. Well, I'm not sure. It's a question from one of our, um, one of our participants. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, so that's a, a tough one, I guess. So social sharing, I think we're probably at a point where we're going to have to look again at what communities want from sharing. Uh, a lot of the sharing economy is showing that people will uh, people appreciate recommendations and predictive analysis based on previous data, um, that they appreciate the experience of getting to know other people who have shared the same or similar things, and that they're willing to contribute their feedback uh, in positive and negative ways about what they've shared. And sometimes our, our values and traditions prohibit some of that, and that's going to be really, really tough um, if the rest of the community is moving towards an area of thought that is different from us. So we may have to adapt some of those things. I'm always interested to see libraries that are sharing new and inventive things like tools or um, uh, anything like that, uh, crafting materials, you know, cooking supplies and all of that type of stuff. Um, but are we just sharing things to share them or are we sharing them to bring people together? And that's going to be a big question that we have to tackle as we introduce these new objects or initiatives to share. Well, hopefully you'll be able to find some good literature to put on your website so we can read more about that. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up so that we end on time at 12.45 Eastern time. Um, any Quick final word, Miguel. We've got about one minute. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, joining me. And if I didn't answer a question, like I said, feel free to email me. I'm easy to find, ala.org slash library of the future. Great. And we will also be posting the recording and the chat transcripts to the SustainRT website. So. And I think on the, just a, one correction on that URL, it's, it's Library of the future rather than of TE future, so that people have that correctly. Okay, Madeline back. Thank you so much, Miguel. That was really informative, and I appreciate, we all do appreciate your welcoming attitude toward getting feedback from all of us. So um, let's move on. And as you notice how many things are coming up from SustainRT, it's because we've been really exciting, excited about lots of new projects and opportunities for you all to stay connected to this group. Um, in fact, this coming Monday, not, not in, in November, but actually this Monday in, in October, from 1 to 2 p.m., we're having a tweet up, and we're sponsoring it with Project ARC. So go to our website, and you can get the hashtag and just get on Twitter, and we're going to have all kinds of fast 
paced conversations about sustainability in libraries and in archives. And then our next webinar is Thursday, December 17th, also a half hour. We're going to have another guest, Mike Walker from Energy Stars program, talking about how libraries can conserve energy. And then, of course, midwinter coming up in January, we hope that some of you can join us at our board meeting. We're open to, to everyone's ideas. And we'll also have a social event with Project ARC. And on the topic of January, I want to give you a heads up that nominations will, will soon be called for to be part of our, our leading team of Sustain RT. So keep um, that in mind. You can go to the, um, well, you'll need to be present at the annual conference to be an, an officer of Sustain RT. However, virtual um, attendance is fine for the midwinter. We're trying to do more and more virtually for obvious reasons, I think. So finally, I'm going to wrap up and just take one more minute and talk about all the great um, ways that you can get involved with our various um, our various project teams. We have, um, and again, go to our website under how to get involved. We're still doing this environmental scan. So if you have anything that you've written or people that you know about writing around sustainability and libraries, um, presentations, blog posts, websites, please send them to us and we're going to create ultimately a public database of these various projects. We have a governance team that is working and very successfully connecting to the ALA conference committee about doing more greening. I think many of you will be pleased to see, um, for instance, there are not going to be any more plastic badge holders at conferences from now on. Um, we have a marketing and outreach team. We're shooting for 300 members by the end of this year. So if you are listening and you haven't yet joined, please do. It's $10 added to your ALA membership and encourage your friends to do the same. And finally, the team that put this together, we call ourselves Online Education. And we'd be happy to have more hands-on to help make these great webinars happen. Um, and, and sort of tickler is um, we've also been approached recently by a publisher whose name I won't yet mention, but I'm pretty sure we'll do a webinar with them sometime in the early winter. So people are starting to notice Sustain RT out in the wider world, and we're really excited that you want to learn about us too. And that wraps up what I needed to say. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar and the Tweet Up and all the other events. Yes, thanks, and uh, thanks, Beth, and, and especially to Miguel for your great presentation. <laughs>